first candle, which is purple, symbolizes hope. It represents the expectation felt in anticipation of the coming of Messiah. The second candle, also purple, represents faith. It is called the Bethlehem candle as a reminder of Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem. The third candle is pink and symbolizes joy. The third Sunday of Advent is Gaudette Sunday and is meant to remind us of the joy that the world experienced at the birth of Jesus, as well as the joy that the faithful have reached the midpoint of Advent. On the fourth week of Advent, we light the final purple candle to mark the final week of prayer and penance as we wait for the birth of our Saviour. The final candle symbolises peace. It reminds us of the message of the angels. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The white candle is placed in the middle of the wreath and lit on Christmas Eve. This candle is called the Christ candle and represents the life of Christ. The colour white is for purity because Christ is our sinless, pure Saviour. Welcome to worship on the second week of Advent here at Front Royal Presbyterian in this virtual space where we get to reach beyond the walls and into your homes and around the world. If you're visiting, a sincere welcome to you. I hope you take some time to put your name in the chat box and introduce yourself. And if you have any questions about the church, you may of course call me or check out our website. It has lots of great information and stories and devotions and videos on it couple of announcements. Um, we have been receiving pledge cards. Thank you. I am overwhelmed by your generosity and your love for the work that we do here at this church. Um, you can check the website for our little annual goal and see how we're doing. We did it in a funny way. It's a treat container for Monty because, well, he's selfish and hungry. Thank you. Today I'm recording. It's Thursday, but thank you in advance for all of you who helped with dinner together tonight. It's always a joy to serve in the community. And if you'll notice, right outside of the Baptist Church now, we even have banners to invite more people to dinner. So thank you for supporting that ministry. And if you would like to in the future, you can contact D. Thank you for those that delivered reach bags. Thank you to those that adopted the Salvation Army kids. Every single one was adopted by different people, so thank you for your generosity. Don't forget that we have the alternative Christmas um, options where you can um, buy a, a mask or a candy bar, and it's a $20 donation towards COVID relief in Ethiopia. You would then receive a card and the, and the mask or the chocolate bar to give as a gift, as a um, way to say thanks for all that God does for us so that we can give back. Next week is wonderful. You guys are all going to want to tune in. 
It'll be our Christmas music festival. The choir has been working very hard to put some wonderful music together to get us in the mood. It's kind of sad this year we don't get to sing carols, but this year we get to enjoy, and I love that the choir is working in new and amazing ways. Devotions are still available right outside the church office or in the church office or online. I hope you're taking some time to read those during this Advent period and turning that space of your home into a worship space so that you guys can get ready for the coming of Christ. Thank you to the Dusenberries for helping with the Advent wreath lighting today and for Donna Jordan for serving as liturgist. And finally, I have to say this again and again and again because I want to make sure you hear me. We are having Christmas Eve service here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. That is by reservation only. I know that sounds horrible, but we're doing that in order to make sure that we don't get too many people in the church on Christmas Eve. We are getting close to 30 individuals, which means that after that um, reaches that limit, we will open up a five o'clock service and then you can register for an earlier service if you like. The Christmas in the Barn will also be by reservation, so we're asking that you reserve your spot, and then after you reserve your spot, uh, maybe a week or so later, I will send a packet out, including the address as to where to meet us. That is for all ages, not just for kids. So I hope you'll take advantage of those Christmas Eve options. The uh, Barn is on the 23rd and that you will join us in celebrating the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. We promise to do all that we can to keep you safe. Now, let us worship the Lord our God together. fix our eyes upon the true light as we gather in worship today. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 we find this promise, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And Isaiah reminds us in chapter 26 verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is focused on you because he trusts in you. The first candle reminded us of hope. The second Advent candle is the candle of peace. The peace we seek in our hearts as we await the coming of Christ and peace on earth as announced by the angels. Do we truly seek peace? If we are honest with ourselves in this crazy world of 2020, peace is one of the last words we would use to describe it. Quarantine, isolation, divided elections, protests and riots, and when we consider how focused we are on the controversial news of the day, 
we must also realize we play a part in it. Mm -hmm. To speak of peace makes little sense. It seems just like a pipe dream. In our messy Christmas here at FRPC, we acknowledge the chaos we have in our own lives and seek to find Christ in the midst of it. We don't simply throw up our hands and say, oh well, and we don't simply hide in the dark expecting nothing to change. When we recognize the world that Christ chose to enter, we must also seek to find him in it. He can be found in the peace of a sleeping child or in the prayers of nurses and doctors as they tend to the dying. He can be found in the peace of a FaceTime call with grandparents. He can be found in the peace of a silent night when our dreams can give us hope. Let us pray. Lord, in a season when every heart should be happy and light, many of us are struggling with the heaviness of life, burdens that steal the joy right out of our stockings. In a world where worry, not peace, prevails, stir up that good news again. This Advent, make it real in our hearts. Never have we needed your joy and peace more than now. You have promised rest for the weary, victory for the battle-scarred, peace for the anxious, and acceptance for the broken-hearted. Not just at Advent, but every day of the year. Your name is still called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. We know that peace on earth can only come when hearts find peace with you. You are still our joy. You are still our peace. You are no longer a babe in the manger. You are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we still celebrate you as Lord this Christmas and always. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. responding. So I'm going to give you the answer. John the Baptist. And he was a wild and crazy looking man. He lived in the wilderness. He wore camel hair. And get this, he ate locusts and wild honey. Man, but everybody came to him because he had a message for everybody that said, you need to tell God of your sins and be baptized and forgiven. And so John the Baptist is pretty important because as we're in Advent, we kind of have to get our hearts ready for Jesus too. And sometimes when we get our hearts ready, we have to say something that we did wrong. But part of getting ready for Christmas also is being thankful that God loves us. And we have lots to be thankful for here at, well, for here at Front Royal Presbyterian. And Heather, what are you thankful for today? Ah, yay for the choir, recognizing deadlines and working hard. Absolutely, I'm looking forward to next week. That's going to be a wonderful celebration. Um, Misty? I'm thankful for, um, during Christmas time, the joy that people seem to have. They're just more joyful. Yes, there is a lot of joy, and you know, you, you, you might think it's not there because we're not together as much, but you can definitely feel it and experience it. I am thankful for the beautiful Advent wreath that Pat Lee put to get together for us. I hope you saw that when we lit the um, Advent candle. That Advent wreath reminds us it's a circle. And it reminds us that God's love has no beginning and no end. And thank you, Pat, for um, gracing our church with that beautiful thing. Monty, he's just thankful for trees. You know, he just is, everybody says, oh my gosh, he's getting bigger. I don't think he is. I think he's just holding his own. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we confess that sometimes we do things that don't make you happy. And we confess that sometimes we do them anyway. Remind us, Lord, to prepare our hearts, not only as we confess our sins, but as we look around and we're grateful for all the good things that you have given us. Help us to see them, acknowledge them, and share the joy with others. Amen. This morning's first scripture reading is from the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. God's people are comforted. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, 
Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we go to God in prayer today, I have two prayer concerns that I bring up with to you. We've been keeping the Ostermeyers. They were previous members that moved in our prayers. Gary had a stroke and he is in the hospital and it's very difficult for them because obviously with COVID, they can't have visitors. So we keep the Ostermeyers in our prayers. We also praise the Lord that Elaine King's son came through with surgery. He's got about a three month um, recovery. So we continue to pray for him, but if you get a chance, give Elaine a call. I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. Let us pray. This week, Lord, on this second week of Advent, our word is peace. And we confess that we don't quite know what that word means. We're accustomed to wars both around the world and in our own homes and communities. We're accustomed to hearts that are filled with anger and anguish and anxiety and torment. We confess, Lord, that we do not seek peace with one another because to have anger gives us more control. So, Lord, when we speak of peace, we don't speak just of that day of the Lord when all of the guns we put down and the hands of friendship will be lifted up. We speak not only of that wonderful passage from Isaiah when the lion will lay down with the lamb. We speak not just of idyllic visions of, of everybody joining together as one community. But when we speak of peace, we speak also of our own hearts and our own minds. To have a peace within us that says, I will not worry because God, you are in control. To have a peace in our mind that says, I am God's child, I am loved. To have a peace in our heart that has the ability to think beyond ourselves and just those that we care about and share that peace with those that maybe only you love. So when we trivialize peace, Lord, to just one or two areas of our life, we are not asking for the peace of Advent. We are asking, Lord, humbly, for you to bring the peace of your kingdom, if only for just a moment. And use us, Lord. Allow us, humble us, open our hearts and our minds to make just a small opening so that you might enter in. That we might use not words of anger, but words of love. That we might seek peace not only in our homes or at our jobs, but in our community. And we recognize, Lord, that finding and working towards that peace is hard and it's exhausting. But it is you, Lord, that reminds us we are never alone. It is you that says, peace I give to you. And you gave us your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to simply worship. We give great thanks that you are a God that, it, that moves beyond walls and barriers. You are a God that seeks not just to be in one place, but in all places. So let us open up our homes, our hearts, and all of who we are to invite you in this Christmas. 
Prepare our hearts. Help us to hear again the words of John the Baptist. As harsh as they are and as hard as they are to hear, repent is not a word that we usually welcome. But Lord, help it ignite something in us that says, I need to repent and to stand gloriously before you, knowing that our sins are forgiven. Lord, this community, our nation, and all that is around us is so broken, and, and we can't help but get caught in the political mess. We can't help but remember that though we have food on our table tonight, there are so many that stand in food lines. There are so many that do not have jobs. There are so many that don't have anything to put under their Christmas tree, more so this year than ever. So Lord, use our hands and our feet. Bless the gifts that, that these, this wonderful congregation has purchased for the Salvation Army kids. Bless them and let the kids that receive them know that they are loved by the community above all else by you. Be with our leaders, Lord. In these unchartered times, each leader has to choose differently for the situation in which they find themselves. So give them wisdom. We ask, Lord, for your presence and specifically your peace to be in our nation's capital. When there is so much that is unknown, Lord, remind us. Remind us that the power is not in that seat in the White House, but the power is in you alone. And in you we put our trust. For those that are working feverishly on a vaccine, Lord, we give you thanks. For those that are exposing themselves day after day after day to this pandemic, selflessly giving and working and serving, Lord, keep them safe. For those that are home and feeling isolated and feel like that each day is the same and it just keeps going on and on, Lord, give them comfort in your presence. Remind them that they are never alone. For those, Lord, that are sick, specifically the Ostermeyer, Gary, we ask you, Lord, to be with him and let them know that this church continues to pray for them in an active way, hoping and praying that your presence is with them. We lift up Elaine King and her son, give you thanks that surgery went well and pray for healing pray for that mother's worry to to be lifted from Elaine so that she might know that they are all in your hand for those that have COVID those that don't have a bed in a hospital for those that don't even know what it is that is taking over their body those that are breathing their last breaths, Lord. We put them in your care. For this is a week of peace. Help us, Lord, to be that peace in the world in which we live. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now it is time for the offering. When God called... Mary answered, when God wanted to employ her in new and unexpected ways, Mary answered. When God asked her to join with God in changing the world forever, Mary answered. Now it's our turn. As we continue our pledge campaign for 2021, we ask your help in returning pledge cards so that the elders can plan accordingly for the new year. We seek to be a church that is a living and breathing vision of the new kingdom here in our little corner of the world. 
We need your help in order to make that happen. Give if you imagine a world without aggression or violence. Give if you imagine a world without poverty or children going to bed hungry. Give if you imagine a world without oppression, without racism, sexism, or division, so we can all live peacefully as the people of God. Give because you imagine a world where the gospel of love and light overcomes the darkness. You can find a pledge card online or request one from the church office if you didn't receive one. You may give online at tithe.lee.com, mail a check, or stop by and say hi and drop it off in person. Let us pray. We give thanks, Lord, because you have blessed us beyond anything we can begin to count or measure or even acknowledge. So out of the blessings that you have given to us, receive now these gifts and tithes, and us, use us and all that we have to bring glory to your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned in the children's sermon, in the second week of Advent, we meet John the Baptist, an odd character. And he doesn't quite fit in our manger scene, so he's at the very beginning. And we're going to be reading from Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. This is the Message Bible reading. Hear now the word of the Lord. The good news of Jesus Christ, the message, begins here following to the letter the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Watch closely. I'm sending my preacher ahead of you. He'll make the road smooth for you, thunder in the desert, prepare for God's arrival, make the road smooth and straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wild, preaching a baptism of life change that leads to the forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem. As they confessed their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life. John wore a camel hair habit tied at the waist with a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild honey. As he preached, he said, repent. The real action comes next. The star in this drama to whom I am a mere stagehand will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. But his baptism will be a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit. And it will change you from the inside out. My friends, the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We are continuing in our messy Christmas, and as we do that today, we're going to meet the cleanup crew, but first, let's bow our heads. Lord, your word is eternal. Your word is truth. It is life. It is breath. It is fresh, new, and amazing in this place. Use the words that I have simply to glorify your name. Amen. Before we get too deep into the scripture, I want to make sure you understand a point. As last week I said, it's a messy Christmas and God comes into our mess. This week we're going to meet John the Baptist. And yes, he calls for a repentance of sins. But I don't want you to get me wrong. That's so that we can recognize who we are. And then we can be prepared for Christ's arrival. It is not that you have to confess in order that God may come. So we continue on our messy Christmas, and normally, as it probably is in your house, the cleanup crew comes December 26th. At that time, everybody has to clean up the massive paper everywhere and the stuffing. You have to, to put all of the stockings, you know, all the little things in your stockings away. You take it all out to the curb and everybody gets to see what you got for Christmas. But this year, the cleanup crew comes first, and it comes in the form of a strange messenger, John the Baptist. Camel's hair. I don't think that's comfortable. As I said, you're not going to find him on any Christmas cards or in any nativity scene. He is the rough and tumble guy that we're not quite sure what to do with. The church puts him at the beginning of Advent because, well, we don't want him too close to when we're trying to be all nice comfortable. Even more than that, his words, great in your skin, great in your ears. He yells, repent. So you just got to imagine this wild and crazy guy out in the wilderness, and the one word that he keeps saying is, and very loudly, repent. Because then when you do, you will be changed from the inside out. And it amazes me that so many people came to see him. It says great crowds from Judea to Jerusalem came to see him. And I can understand that because maybe it was just mere curiosity. Maybe they had finished all their you know, Netflix series and, and didn't have anything else to do. Maybe they, it was just peer pressure. They wanted to be in on the event. Needless to say, they don't just come. They listen and they are baptized by John the Baptist into a new life, into a new kingdom, into a way that John the Baptist says, I'm turning you inside out. And if we're honest with ourselves, if I wore camel's hair and ate locusts, A, I'd be a whole lot skinnier. Our church would not be very full. Nobody wants to hear the message, repent. So I always wonder why so many people came. Why were so many people there? If I preached that message, well, I'd preach us out of the business of being the church. Because we justify our sins. Do you hear that? We justify our sins. We protect ourselves and hide our sins. There are very few of us that want to stand in front of a crowd and say, I am a sinner, I need to repent. We've justified our sins in all sorts of different ways. Yes, 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 I know, I cheated on my wife, but the marriage was over anyway. It was just a piece of paper. It was just a document at this point. I've done nothing wrong. Do you love how we justify our sins? We've explained it away. Instead of being a grievous act against God that we don't feed the hungry right before us, we make up excuses. Well, they don't really deserve it. We remember things differently in order to justify our actions. Because if you tell yourself a lie repeatedly enough, you will actually believe it as truth. So we are protecting ourselves instead of going to this repentance place. Because if we're honest, it's just un-American to confess. We're the best. 
We're good people. We do what is right. And I'm going to take a, a, a kind of a word, and it's gaslighting. And gaslighting is, um, it's actually from an old movie with Ingrid Bergman in like the 30s, where a husband tried to make his wife go crazy by manipulation, psychological manipulation. But I'm going to take this word gaslighting and suggest that maybe we are not busy gaslighting one another, but gaslighting ourselves. Trying to convince ourselves into a different reality. We begin to believe that alternate reality. And we begin to consider it as our own, whether it's true or not. And so when we do that, we manipulate our realities to fit our ideas or ideals. And when they stand in competition to scripture, we believe ourselves. I'm not sure if I've shared this story with you or not. It's just hilarious. Well, it's sad, but I'm going to tell it to you again. If you haven't heard it, enjoy. If you have, then you can, you know, go get something to drink at home. Orange juice coffee. Jacob was probably about three years old. We lived in Charlotte and he had gotten put in time out for something in his room. And I go up and check on him after just a, maybe 15 minutes. And as I walk into his room, he's sitting there crisscross applesauce in front of his dresser, which was an antique family heirloom. And in his hand is a piece of the wood from the dresser. And being the fantastic mom that I am, I thought, oh, this is a great learning time. I'm going to teach him confession. I'm going to teach him to acknowledge and own his sins. And so I said to Jacob, I said, who did that to your dresser? He'd been caught red-handed. Remember, it's right there in his hand. Who did this to your dresser? I said, and, and Jacob looks up with me, not even putting the piece down. And he says, Devin, do this. Devin was a friend of his. He hadn't been over for a few days. I knew Devin didn't do it. So I got my best. Jacob, who did this to your dresser? Pushing him one step further. Thomas, do this. Another friend that hadn't been over for a while, and he still has it in his hand. And I'm expecting him to own it, to repent, confess. You know, I wouldn't have been sad if I'd seen a few tears come out of his eyes. I'm so sorry. I was sadly mistaken. And you know, third time's a charm. Jacob Woodrow Evans, who did this? Sarah the dog. Sarah dog did this. And I just about blew my top. Jacob, why is the piece of wood in your hand? And he looks and he hides it. I didn't do it. So I tell you this because it's a very simple toddler story, but it is in reality our lives. His response was first blaming other people, and we are good at that, aren't we? Passing the blame to someone else. Or even if we don't pass the blame, if we find ourselves caught in a sin, we pick up on everybody else's sins and start, well, theirs is bigger than mine. Blame. Second is denial. And Jacob denied that it was even done. He was changing his own reality. And, and here I am, I had taken psychology classes in college and I was failing him miserably because he was a toddler and did not understand. He didn't understand the logic. He was just trying to protect himself. And as illogical as it may seem how he passed the blame, that protecting himself is not just from a three-year-old toddler. Because he may have been three years old and justified in his growth and maturity, but I dare to suggest that we have a whole lot of grown-up toddlers walking around in this community and in this world, passing blame, denying the truth, and living in their own reality. It's a perfect example of that psychological technique of gaslighting. It involves lying and exaggerations that are repeated often and over again. Devin did it, Thomas did it, Sarah the dog did it. Repetition of falsehoods, denial of the reality, 
And when challenged, the situation is escalated in an attempt to confuse those around him, hiding the piece of wood. Jacob had no clue. It was just to protect himself. But I ask again, how many of us are just grown-up toddlers? How many of us are willing to accept our own reality as truth over what is the truth of the gospel? Conform our ideas. Conform what we like, what we want in this world to protect ourselves even when it is blatantly in the face of the gospel. Enter Isaiah. I love Isaiah. You probably know he's my favorite prophet. Enter Isaiah because he was using a form of gaslighting in a passage from the, uh, chapter 52. And this is a familiar one, but hear it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Isaiah is calling us out. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Isaiah was condemning those that have this distortion of reality and think so highly of themselves to protect themselves again at all costs. And this is where our psychological path intersects with John the Baptist. We are, each and every one of us, all of us, individually, communally, spiritually, politically, all of us are quite simply gaslighting ourselves into believing our own truth, our own reality. We have convinced ourselves that sin is not sin. That sin is, is, is not a reality in our lives. We retell the story the way we choose to remember it. That's not what I did. We pass blame to others. Liberals, well, they're just too sensitive. Conservatives, they're just gun-toting militia. And when we're honest with ourselves, when we realize this, the reality in the world around us is completely canceled. And it is only my reality that matters. And all of a sudden, every man and woman for themselves. Ariel Levy is a, is a journalist, and she says one of the most insidious things about gaslighting is the denial of reality. Being denied what you have seen with your own eyes and you know to be true. And that's hard for us as people of faith because blessed are those who have seen, but even blessed more are those who have not seen. And we are those that did not see the risen Christ. But in a reality in which we live, the things that are real around us, what do we call them when we don't like them or we don't approve of them or we don't like where they're going? Oh, that's fake news. So nothing means anything anymore at all. It's all chaos. My reality is the only one that matters. Walter Brueggemann said, and this, you're not going to like this quote, the crisis in the U.S. church has almost nothing to do with being liberal or conservative. It has everything to do with giving up on faith and the discipline of our Christian baptism and settling for a common, generic U.S. identity that is part patriotism, part consumerism, part violence, and part affluence. Are those our values? It offends us. How dare you question my patriotism? We get defensive when anyone criticizes our loyalty to our wonderful and good nation. Because in reality, we use a lot of what is listed above. Patriotism, consumerism, justified violence and affluence. To gaslight ourselves into justifying our actions against what scripture tells us 
we should be and do. We are a people that we are sure we're not wrong. We may make mistakes, but not sins. We are sure the charges are exaggerated. Your memories are different than mine. Regrettably so, and they may hurt you, but you consented. We're good people, really. Is that enough? So I return again to John the Baptist, and how many of us would find ourselves actually willingly going to that place of repentance? Who truly wants to be turned inside out and face the reality of this world rather than the reality that you have claimed in your own life? Are we really willing to confess our sins without justifying their actions? I can get away with paying my house cleaner less than a living wage because she's undocumented and she shouldn't be here anyway. Are you following me? Ask yourself if you're a spectator on the hill just watching John the Baptist and all those other people. Are you just part of the in crowd seeing what's going on? Or are you willing to prepare the way? Are you willing to prepare your heart? Because today it has to begin with you. We're really busy looking at all the sins of other people. Maybe it's time we look at ourselves. There's a house in a quaint little historic town in Massachusetts. This one's for you, David Edwards. It dates back before the Revolutionary War. And if you look closely at it, you'll see in the corner that there's of the house that it has been cut away. It looks really odd. They actually, it's like a piece of the house is missing, like a, a birthday cake. They took their first little bite of the cake and it's not complete anymore. Now there are a couple of theories as to why this happened. First is, it was easier for coal wagons to get through without the corner. You can see that that corner is very tight. A second theory is, removing it made it easier for sewage and waste to flow down the streets. But the story that stuck is that General Lafayette came to visit. His carriage was pulled by six fine, beautiful white horses. And when they got to that part in the street, he couldn't navigate through. So one of his men jumped out, took an ax, and took part of the house out so Lafayette could pass on by. It strikes me that the three theories have everything to do with our passage today and what I've been talking about. Consumerism. The coal wagons had to make a way. We will do anything to protect our economy, even at the cost of others' lives. Pride. Lafayette had to have his way regardless of the cost. Boasting of our own strength among others. And my favorite, the sewer, the waste, the filth, the sin. Rather than acknowledge it and clean it up, let's just accommodate our lifestyles to it. Let's just cut out part of our lives, might it be scripture, might it be the word, so that it can still flow freely. You see, we have no worries paving the way, like John the Baptist says, when it benefits our pocket, our pride, or our own self-worth. But heaven forbid, if we have to get to the root of the matter and recognize the reality within each one of us, if we have to stop all the justifying of our actions and gaslighting ourselves into believing God approves of my alternative reality, it's not that bad anyway. We are not ready for the coming of Christ. It's not easy for the people of God because we like security. We like the familiar. We like the safe and the comfortable. And we love to be called beloved. And we love to gather at the manger and we look forward to that. And this second Sunday of Advent in the midst of a pandemic and a revolution and political upheaval, we need a word of comfort and hope. And Isaiah has it. 
Isaiah into our uncontrolled pandemic when we feel isolated, as if we're almost in a time warp where we don't know what time of day it is or matter of what month of year. We need to hear comfort and hope. And that is what Isaiah gives us. He gives us this word to a bunch of exiles, and he gives it to us today. Peace, my friends. Comfort, comfort you, my people. Thousands of cars are lined up at food banks all over the country. More than 25 million Americans reported last week that they didn't have enough food to eat. 25 million. But we are the richest country in the world. We've got it under control, pride. And then there are those of us that have the opportunity to work from home or in a safe place with few people, and then there are those that risk illness and death in order to earn a paycheck if they still have a job. Enter Isaiah in the midst of exile and despair. The people of Judah are in a strange land, as are we. The people of Judah, their situation is one of displacement, anxiety, and suffering, as are we. And we must acknowledge the pain of our present reality. But we also must dare to acknowledge God's presence within it as well. The hope of which Isaiah speaks is not anything we can see. The hope of which Isaiah speaks is not a hope in a political leader or in our bank accounts or in the stock market or even in a vaccine. The hope that Isaiah speaks of isn't January 1st, 2021, when we can put this behind us, because this hope that Isaiah speaks of to them and to us is God's faithfulness in the midst of it all. And for that reason alone, it is true and it is good, it is faithful, and it is trustworthy. It is something that you can ground yourself in. So we must look inward and judge ourselves. We must be willing to listen to the voice that's crying loudly in the wilderness, repent, and listen to that still small voice in the vo- in our back of our head and that calls us to self-examination. When we do that, and when we put our trust in the grounded, wonderful faith that God's always with us, we may begin our journey to Bethlehem. We can walk through the the strange and unexpected ways. We can meet the cleanup crew, John the Baptist. And we can offer ourselves a new beginning. A newness that can be viewed as a blessing and gift. But also one that forces change. And none of us like change. But if you consider the birth of a child, it's a wonderful, beautiful event. It's exciting, and it's fantastic, but it's not easy. Caring for a new child takes work and adjustment and learning new things, just as your life, when you find your way turned inside out, it takes adjustment and change and learning new things. And we will find our way to Bethlehem, though the road may be turny and go through the wilderness. But we can find our road to Bethlehem when we pour out our shame that we've been hiding in ourselves. That requires us to stop. Look around. Stop being the monitors of what everybody else is doing and instead look inward and honestly at ourselves. In that place where we are hiding our own collection of false idols. So this is to be our road to Bethlehem. Prepare the way, cut out the filth, align yourself with God's word. Beat down your inner justification of your sins and listen to that still small voice of God saying you are beloved. Pave a way through the wilderness of your pride and your greed. Smooth out the potholes where your hidden sins have made your life and your journey bumpy and uncomfortable. It's terrifying. 
it winds us through our own unworthiness. But when we follow that road to Bethlehem, it also leads us to a place where we may be born anew. And there in Bethlehem, we can hear Isaiah's words. Comfort, comfort you, my people. All glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. And seek peace. Do goodwill for others, recognizing that we are each and every one of us unworthy, but also beloved by God. Go, be the light of Christ in this dark and terrifying world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. See you. 